Thank you. Thanks for reminding us who we are. Well, the timing of this passage is a little awkward. We're in a one another series, and today I'm going to talk about washing one another's feet, which happened before Easter and was on the agenda, but then Billy Graham died, and so Billy got this slot that this was going to get. Listen to this amazing story. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he was wrapped in. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, A person who has taken a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I got some bad news for you. Today is April 15th. Your taxes are due. I think I've told you before about the man who was on vacation and he came across this little boy who was choking. In fact, his face was turning blue, and his mom was getting really upset and turned to the man and said, can you help me, can you help me? And so the man jumped into action, and he grabbed the boy, and he turned him upside down and shook him so fervently that finally the quarter that the little child had swallowed was dislodged from his throat. Well, gave the child back to the mom, and mom was so happy. She goes, wow, that's amazing. Are you a physician? And he says, no, I'm from the IRS. <laughs> you know, I love the way this chapter of the Bible starts. Jesus loved his disciples to the end, to the full extent. When it says to the end, it means till death do us part. And friends, we know that because there's eternal life, that means there is no end. There's no circumstance that prevents him from loving us. His love is constant, continuous, consistent. Even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His love was pronounced over us before we even got started. Amen. And it would be easy to skim over this foot washing text as a dramatic lesson in humility. And actually, this example should not be minimized uh, to show how rare this behavior is. When somebody does it like Mother Teresa, we canonize her. Okay? Uh, serving others in this format is a rare attitude. You know, I was surprised to find in my Oxford Dictionary that the word couch potato was in there. Did you know that couch potato is in the dictionary? Yeah, it was entered in in 1976. And, and you know what a couch potato is? It's somebody who does little or no exercise and watches a lot of television. And, and you got the visual, somebody sitting in the lazy boy and they got the remote in one hand and chips and a beverage in the other. 
a blank stare on their face, and they stay there forever? Yeah, it's the couch potato. Well, guess what? Fortunately, there's not a term called the pew potato in the dictionary. And, you know, Christians who make it to church and they watch what's going on, they snack on a little religion, but they're not inclined to get involved in any Christian activity or spiritual exertion. They see Christianity as a spectator sport. And really, you can't blame them because service is not fun. I mean, think about the people working in the nursery right now with screaming toddlers. The drudgery of our Sunday school teachers who have to show up every Sunday morning and teach the little ones about Jesus. The thankless task of serving coffee and snack to promote fellowship. Coming early to open up the doors and and hand out the bulletins and turn on the air conditioning, very important in Florida. Those who wait after it's all done to close up shop, pick up the bulletins, wash empty coffee pots. It's all this small, mundane stuff that involves running a church that nobody wants to do. And we excuse ourselves. Moses said, send someone else. I I have nothing to offer you, God. Uh, We can rationalize stepping forward because, after all, the professional clergy and staff can do it better than I can do it, so why should I do it in an inferior manner? Uh, Some people will say, you know, the positions needed at the church, they don't really fit my gifts. Others will say, you know, I do this all week from my profession. I don't want to have to do this in my extracurricular life or my favorite. I don't want to deprive somebody else of an opportunity to serve. Okay. And here's the problem. If your faith isn't put in motion, your soul starts to atrophy. We're, We're meant to be in action, not passive with our Christianity. And the thing about being a follower of Jesus is it involves our everyday life. When you go to work, you have opportunities to put Jesus into motion. When you're at home, there's lots of opportunities to put Jesus into motion. In your social circles, in your networks, great opportunity for for people to encounter Jesus. Pastor Bill likes to say, we're, we're trying to put God on display. Through our actions, through our life, we can see who God is. It reminds me of the story of the renowned artist Paul Gustave Dorr. He lived back in 1821 to 1883. He lost his passport while he was traveling across Europe, and so he comes to his country, and he says, "Um, listen, I lost my passport, but I'm this famous artist. Can you let me in? And the official says, well, you know, lots of people come and say there's somebody famous, hoping to get past the the border here, and uh, I I don't know if that's who you are. He goes, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a test. He gives him a paper and a pencil. He goes, I want you to draw those people over there. Okay, then we'll see if you're an artist or not. Well, the artist does it skillfully and quickly in such a masterful way, the guard says, okay, you're obviously this great artist. Go on through. And and it's kind of neat because his work confirmed his word. And friends, I want you to hear me. In Ephesians 2.10, you are called God's workmanship. And the term here is for an artist, a craftsman who creates something that expresses their talent and who they are, communicates the nature of the artisan. And this means that you are God's masterpiece. You're the one that's created to communicate who he is. And friends, according to the Bible, God prepared in advance for you to do good works. It says in Ephesians, before the foundation of the world was laid, you were in his mind. It's hard to understand this. It sounds so vast that before everything got started, God already had a relationship with you in mind, already had a plan for your life, already had a purpose and, you know, you like to think, yeah, I was born in 1960-something. Um, you know, I'm going to live a few years. What will be will be. No. You are specifically made in the image of God for the purposes of God with a relationship with God in mind. You're not here by chance. And by the way, the plan, according to God, is to serve others. 
And really, Christians live differently. We spend our money with an eye on building the kingdom of God. We're generous with our resources towards those in need. We give ourselves to other people who are in need, even when it's inconvenient. It could be small jobs like extending kindness or sending encouraging emails, cleaning up after others. You see, when we serve other people, it demonstrates who we belong to, Jesus Christ. How we care for one another proves that we are his disciples. And the ability to do this reveals that our self-worth does not come from our titles or position. It comes from God's definition of you. You know, we get all excited about titles and positions. People will come into my office and they'll see all my degrees and go, ooh, now God, don't be impressed. It just means that I'm dying by degrees, okay? (laughs) Besides, in Jeremiah 9, it says, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the mighty man of his might or the rich man of his wealth, but let him who boasts boast that he knows me and understands my ways. That's the only thing that matters. And what really matters is that God knows you, and he loves you. You know, I'll catch one of our leaders out in the parking lot sometimes. I go out there to pray over the church on Saturdays, and one of my leaders will be there picking up trash, dirty diapers left by people, you know, visiting the town. And and I'll be so shocked to see him here. I go, what are you doing here? And, you know, he's too important. He's too influential. He, he, he's too sophisticated to be doing such a demeaning task. Nobody asked him to do it. He just wants to make sure that anybody coming to church that's going to have an encounter with God is going to have a wonderful experience. See, he doesn't do it except he wants to please his Lord. You know, I'm at the Starbucks the other day, and somebody's dog takes his business right in front of the doorway going in, Okay. And I'm sitting there, and I see this happen, and the owner doesn't see it happen, just kind of casually walks off, and I don't know if I should yell at the owner, hey, check this out. And other people are stopping, you know, there's a big pyramid in the way, they don't know what to do, and it's a problem. And when I have dogs, I got to take care of that problem at home. I know what to do with this problem. It's not my dog, it's not my problem, but I take care of the problem. And nobody noticed I didn't get a free coffee out of the deal. <laughs> and how many times have you walked into a restaurant and, you know, or, or a restroom or even here at the church restroom and the kids have been in there and you know what happens when the kids have been in there, right? It's a mess. And you know, you step over the mess or you go, oh my, there's a mess and you, you clean it up. This happens at home. You know, with, we can serve our, our spouse and our kids. We can serve our, our neighbors down, down the alleyway. We can serve our work associates where, where we're employed. You know, being a servant, it doesn't just lead in a life group. Even in the smallest ways, you're making an impact for eternity. And, and by the way, according to Colossians, whatever you do, whenever you work, do it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord, not for earthly masters. And this really changes the way you go through life. Now, Jesus said, what you did for the least of them, you did unto me. And so whatever you're doing, you're doing this because you're in a relationship with God. You're responding to God's calling on your life. You're engaged in the the pursuit of pleasing the Lord. And when you go about life this way, it changes the dynamics. Again, your identity is solid. You're not worried about being a servant. You're worried about pleasing the Lord. Now, Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 16, our good works cause others to praise our Father in heaven. I remember we used to do a street ministry where the drug addicts were were located, and we'd go late at night, and we'd pull up our truck and put the, the truck bed down and give out free coffee and food to all the addicts and pray over them and give them information where they could go to the rehab centers. And, and, and one time this prostitute comes over, and it was kind of weird because... The pimps were just like 20 feet away from us, and she comes wandering over, and so what are you guys doing here? I mean, I know why the police come here, and I know why the social service workers come here, but what are you doing here? He said, well, we're followers of Jesus Christ, and we happen to know that Jesus especially loves people in neighborhoods like this one, and so we thought we would come and just make sure that everybody knows that that, that God loves you. Well, she immediately starts breaking down and tells us her story. And gives us big hugs. I was worried about that. 
And, and here's the deal. You know, we, we were able to tell her how God feels about her, which is a lot different how she thought God felt about her. And, and she encountered the love of God, which she didn't know was available to her. It was a really powerful moment. And, and friends, you don't have to go down to the mean streets of your town in order to do that. Okay, you can do this at work. Because there's lots of people who don't know who they are that think God's against them or are afraid of God, who've received misinformation about God, and you get to initiate a conversation and set them straight and extend his hands, his love, his words to these people. You know, recently I was in a conversation with somebody, and the conversation was, what would you do if you had 24 hours left to live? Okay. Oh, we had a good conversation. You know, oh, I'd go to the beach. And I'd be with my wife. I'd hang out with my favorite people. I'd, I, I'd listen to my favorite music. I'd go to my, my favorite restaurant. And, and what did Jesus do with his last 24 hours? He washed his disciples' feet. Think about this. Jesus, the presence of Almighty God on earth, takes on the chore of the, the most menial person in the family. The servant. You know, this is all taking place in response to the disciples' conversation, who is the greatest among them? They're arguing about who's the greatest, and Jesus says, okay, I got 24 hours left. <laughs> How do I get through to these guys? Okay, and so he gives them a life lesson that they need to care for one another. He reinforces what he already told them in Luke 9, 48. Whoever is least among you is the greatest. And friends, I think it's when you and I are unsure of our identity, that's when we fight the hardest to assert who we are, and we struggle to make sure nobody infringes upon our rights. Interesting that this foot washing was supposed to happen before you came into the house for the meal, but these guys are already engaged in the meal, and nobody's feet have been washed. You see, the breach in etiquette was due to because of the pride and self-importance of their attitudes. I'm not going to wash anybody's feet. And by the way, this isn't the first time that Jesus has sat down to a meal and, and, and his feet weren't washed. One time a Pharisee invited him over. And extended, instead of extending the, the courtesy of a common gracious host to, to wash the, the guest's feet, he just ignored that. And so a sinful woman broke into the Pharisee's courtyard and broke down at Jesus' feet washing his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. The Pharisee was appalled that this lowly servant would be in his presence and that Jesus would allow somebody like this to touch him. But for Jesus, this wasn't a lowly servant. This was a child of God. You know, it's interesting that Jesus took off his outer garments and wrapped himself in a towel and then served them. You know, the next time Jesus had his garments removed and was stripped down, he was beaten, mocked, and crucified. And it's interesting how Peter protests to Jesus taking on the servant role. No, you can't serve me. Notice he didn't volunteer to take over the job. He doesn't say, give me the towel and let me finish off the disciples' dirty feet. No, that's beneath him, so it's a little bit confusing here. And Jesus is teaching the disciples to stop thinking like you're a guest of honor at the table and think like a servant of others for the meal. I mean, there's a church in Santa Fe, Mexico. It only has one door into the building, and it has a sign over it, servant's entrance. So the only way to come in or out of the house of worship is to go through the servant's entrance. I think this is just a beautiful imagery of, of who we are and what we're about. And I don't think that this... This foot washing was merely an object lesson. I think that Jesus is washing every one of his disciples' feet and covering them in prayer and preparing them for their spiritual journey because, friends, this is the last time he's going to see them this way. I want to remind you that Jesus sits at the right hand of God praying for you and interceding on your behalf and preparing you for the spiritual journey that's underway in your life right now as well. Well, here's the important t statement of the text. If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. In other words, it's essential that we receive what he has done for us. 
It's not about doing more for him. It's not about reading your Bible and, 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 and making sure that you do this and don't do that and cleaning up your life. No, it's about what he does for us. We need what he brings. We couldn't fix our problem with God. So Jesus does. And when he's washing their feet, he's not really removing dirt from their feet. He's removing sins from their souls. And don't we usually think, well, let me get it together first, and, and then I'll be ready for God. The Bible tells us that we're never going to get clean enough in order to receive God. And God knew that, and that's why he sent Jesus. Well, Peter flops from one extreme to the other. Well, if you're going to wash my feet, then wash all of me. And Jesus says, what I've done is sufficient for you. And this is important. You can't add to what he's done for you on the cross. It's not okay, Jesus did this, and now if I do this, that, and the other, I'm okay with God. Remember what he said? It is finished. I took care of you. You're now under my covering, my sacrifice. You have access to God at all times now. We don't supplement Christ's cleansing with our piety or our rituals. St. Francis of Assisi commented in his overindulgent pursuit of holiness, he found he became less like Christ than by just a simple application of his faith. I remember when I was a young man, I would fast, you know, because I wanted to please the Lord and pursue the Lord. And, you know, 20 hours into not eating, I would find that, you know, I had an irritable attitude and I was rather cantankerous, exactly the opposite of what I was trying to pursue being Christ-like. And did you catch the comment that Jesus makes regarding Peter? You are clean. Now, wait a minute. In a couple of hours, he's about to deny the Lord three times. How could he say that he's clean? Yeah, Peter folded under peer pressure, just like you and I fail and falter at times. And Jesus knows that we're going to fail and falter. And he went to the cross because we're covered by grace, not by our works. We're covered by what he's done for us, not what we do for him. And really, friends, Christianity, it's not so much about doing the right thing, it's having the right heart. It's extending compassion towards those on the wrong side of the fence. You know, don't we usually withdraw from folks with flaws, with moral flaws and sinful behaviors? Uh, we tend to criticize rather than invest in them. And, you know, God, what does he do? He, he usually uh, invests in the people who have fallen and, and helps them get up. And we do the exact opposite. We, 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 we remove ourselves from them. Max Lucado asks, can the sick mock the ill? Can the blind judge the deaf? Why do the sinful condemn the sinner? Peter, who denied the Lord, preached the Pentecost sermon that brought 3,000 people into the family. Samson, in, in his weakness, was blinded, but he was re-empowered to level the pillars of the godless. A stuttering shepherd became the mighty deliverer Moses. They laughed at Noah because it wasn't raining when he built the ark. And here's the objective for the Christian. It's to pick up the fallen brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen to James 5. If one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. It's a pretty serious result when you decide to invest in somebody who, who's wandered off the path. And that takes a servant's heart. It's an inner disposition. Christianity is not about information that we acquire. No, it's doing something for another and not wanting or expecting to thank you. It's not needing recognition. It's not being concerned about receiving praise for our service. In fact, we're supposed to smile when somebody slights you because you were doing it for the Lord. And he's smiling down upon you. Romans 12, 1 says, Offer your bodies a living sacrifice. This is your true form of worship. It's interesting, this isn't about, I think of worship as I come and I'm going to sing these hymns and I'm going to hear a sermon and maybe take communion. And No, worship, it's, it's a living experience with fruit and a tangible transformation that occurs because we've had an encounter with God that touches our lives. 
You know, this little boy had a deformed hand, and he was trying to do this uh, Sunday school exercise. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door, and here's all the people. And he couldn't do it because he had a deformed hand. And so this other little girl said to him, here, let me help you, and we'll be the church together. You know, I, I can't do this Christianity without you. And, and I'm guessing that all of us need one another. That's why the life group tables are out here. I really want you to consider participating. We'll get you set up in a, in a great situation. And you and somebody else together will be the family of Jesus Christ. And, and you're going to see so much power released. Galatians 6.10 says, While we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So whether you're reaching out to, to people who don't go to church or participating with people who do go to church, it's all about you and me realizing we're called to serve one another. Let me close up. A missionary shared that while he was in India, he, he contracted tuberculosis and was confined to a sanitarium in India, okay? Last place he wanted to be. And he didn't speak the language, but he had a whole bunch of Christian tracts in their language, and so he kept trying to hand them out to everybody, and nobody wanted anything to do with his, his Christian literature. And so one night he wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning coughing, and he notices that the guy across the aisle from him is, is trying to get up and trying to get up, and he can't get up and finally falls back to bed and starts crying. Well, the next morning he realizes, you know, the guy was trying to get up to use the restroom and he ended up soiling himself. And the next morning, uh, other patients were yelling at him and, and nurses were rough with him as they had to clean up the mess. One nurse slapped him and he just rolls up into a ball crying. Well, wakes up at two o'clock in the morning the next night and there's the old man trying to get up again. So he gets out of bed, he walks across, helps him up, carries him over to the restroom, holds him up while he uses the restroom, and then carries him back to his bed. And as he lays him down, the old man kisses him on the cheek and says something to him that he doesn't understand. Well, the next morning, somebody wakes him up, and he has a fresh cup of hot tea to give him in motion that he was interested in one of those Christian tracts that he was trying to hand out. And throughout the day, other patients and other staff and, and, and nurses and doctors and interns came and they were curious about this, this literature that he had and he, he was able to distribute it all out. Well, one of the evangelists came to check on the missionary and in the midst of talking with everybody, he found out that a whole bunch of people had given their lives to Jesus Christ and accepted the message of salvation because of the tracks. And he goes, how did you get this out to everybody? Well, it wasn't because he was healthy and strong. No. It wasn't because he knew the language and was able to persuade them. Everybody got interested in Jesus Christ because he served somebody. A trip to the bathroom, the lowliest, made everybody want to know, what makes you tick? Friends, here's the deal. God has a reckless love for you. And he asks us to have a reckless love for everybody else. Josh, would you sing that to us one more time? And I want everybody to go forward on your way past the life group tables and have a God week. Amen. Don't
Still love. 